I'm Francis Durnley, and this is a special episode of Ukraine, the latest. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. The tongue can conceal the truth, but the eyes never. A quote from The Master and Margarita, perhaps one of the great novels of the 20th century, blending fantasy, romance and satire in an irreverent critique of Soviet society. But its author, Mikhail Bagarkov, remains a figure of controversy even today, long after his death in Stalinist Russia, where his work faced censor and condemnation. For Bolgakov was born in Kiev in 1891, when part of the Russian Empire, making him an author claimed historically both by Russia and Ukraine. As such, he is now at the very heart of contemporary discussions about Ukrainian identity. For some, the fact he was born into a Russian intellectual family and wrote in Russian, means he should no longer be associated with the Ukrainian nation. For others, the fact he witnessed the Ukrainian War of Independence between 1917 and 1921, resurrecting it in his novel The White Guard, on its own makes him a pivotal figure in the story of the Ukrainian nation and its capital, especially given the novel's vivid depiction of the city at war as it is today. While in Kyiv, I visited the Bolgarkov Museum, located in his old family home, now the focal point for debates about which writers to condemn or condone in the context of the Russian invasion. There, after a tour of the exhibits, I spoke to my guide, Marina Sichenko, a researcher at the museum, for her take and reflections on the pivotal period of history Bolgarkov recorded and the ways it overlaps with the violence of today. I started by asking her about the statue of Bolkarkov outside of the museum and how it came to be covered in red paint. It happened in May 2023 as a protest against Bulgakov's personality, didn't support the idea of Ukrainian independence back to 1917 to 1920, the time that we now call Ukrainian Revolution. And against him as a writer, the author of uh, such a controversial novel, well, from our point of view, of course, The White Guard, and against the museum as a place that commemorates him and uh, collects and saves his legacy. So nobody took responsibility for it publicly. But we decided to leave it as it is, just to remind everyone that Bulgakov is part of our history of Kyiv. Because we don't say that he belongs to Ukrainian culture, he doesn't. But he belongs to the history of our city. And we'd like to get the message across to Ukrainian society that history must be researched, it must be interpreted, it mustn't be discarded. And we see our mission as an institution to talk about history in a human way, not in an aggressive way, because now we have so much aggression in social media. And we understand that it was just a reaction to what happened two years ago. And tell me about some of the ways in which that nuanced interpretation of history has been carried out in changes at the museum. Well. We used to have a literature exposition. So our museum was first initiated as a literature museum, literature memorial. And due to that social request, let's say, we decided to research and investigate the 
period that Bulgakov spent here. Well, basically, he was a, a Kiev inhabitant for 28 years of his life. That's the most of his life. But the most important period for us now is the Ukrainian Revolution, 1970-1920, because that was the first time we gained our independence officially as a Ukrainian People's Republic. But then we had to fight for it against Bolsheviks and all, all the rest. So that's why it resembles what's happening today with a full-scale in invasion. And that's the historical background of the White Guard novel and of his early works written in 1920, which somehow depict military actions as Bulgakov experienced them. So we just had to explain the situation around that was his resource for his early works. Mm. And part of that is lots of photographs of the various different coups that took mm -hmm. place. Just talk to me about the violence of that time. It is an extraordinary time in Ukrainian and European mm -hmm. history. One of, as you say, revolution violence. And part of the reason you were explaining on the tour that he himself was so... It's controversial now is because he was mm -hmm. not in favour yeah. of a lot of that violence. Mm -hmm. But explain to me why that is the case, because and why, again, that, mm -hmm. that is part of the controversy. Well, he says Kiev experienced 14 coups at that period, and 10 of them he experienced himself firsthand. And, of course, the coups were about uh, military actions all the time. And Bulgakov was a very conservative person, and he was raised with some empire values. And that's why he just couldn't understand the idea of independent Poland or independent Ukraine. Mm. It's based on uh, the white guard, on his character's quotes, let's say. So we have to understand that he didn't have any basis for understanding it any other way, because the empire never prepared people like Bulgakov. I mean, he's the representative of the title nation of the empire. But the empire protected them and itself from any separation ideas. So that's why he just didn't understand the idea of Ukrainian independence. And from our point of view, like today's Ukraine suffering from invaders, to read the White Guard today might feel offensive in some points of that book, but it's just about the characters speaking. And if you are a sharp-eyed reader, yeah, you will see how balanced the author is, because he explains everything that was going on between different social parts of the country in the time of Ukrainian People's Republic, in the time of uh, Hetman Pavlos Skoropatsky and Simon Petlura and the Directorate. And I've heard some Ukrainian historians analyzing that there are some good messages and good ideas about how things were going on. So the author of The White Guard is quite a balanced person, I, I would say. But the characters are more radical. And, well, that was how many people felt at that time it was okay. Mm. And talking about Ukrainian independence, it's important to understand that the Russian Empire suppressed everything about all the Ukrainian patriotic organizations back to World War I, and before that as well, of course. So when Ukrainian People's Republic appeared and stated itself, some people were just shocked by it. And they didn't think that there are so many Ukrainians in Ukraine. <laughs> So I think that was how Bulgakov felt about things. Do you think that he was a man opposed intellectually to Ukrainian independence or really just opposed to violence and radicalism in all forms? I think both would be correct. But, you know, there is no evidence about Bulgakov hating everything Ukrainian in his diary, in his letters, in his friends' the memories about him. I think that he never sounded Ukrainophobic in his uh, real life. 
It's just the characters that do in the white card. But it's just a speculation because we need Mikhail Bulgakov to sit here and we'll ask him questions directly to know the answer. I'm working uh, with sources, with our collection, and everything we deliver must be based on facts. So there is no fact that Bulgakov opposed it in, in an aggressive way. I think, yes, he was against violence, and revolution just made violence be everywhere. And uh, for Bulgakov, as the person from the empire, any form of separation was tragic. I think that would be the most balanced answer, not a speculative one. It's very interesting. Now, you talked on the tour, fascinatingly, about the fact that the White Guard, because it's such a persecuted period of history and so many intellectuals were forced to leave mm -hmm. Ukraine, that the book itself became, for a long time, from the 1960s onwards, when it was mm -hmm. published in full in the USSR, yeah. a historical document itself. Mm -hmm. People understood that period through the lens of the novel. Yeah. Why is that problematic? You know, even now, sometimes I would have some elderly people come into the museum and I feel that they have this inner opposition towards what I'm saying about Ukrainian intelligentsia. Mm. It's the heritage of the empire and then from the Soviet period as well, because Ukrainians were mostly depicted as peasants and it's something like folk culture. But in fact, uh, when we now have so many research and serious investigations on history of the Ukrainian revolution period, we can clearly say that all the Ukrainian statesmen of that period, including Mikhailo Vrushevsky, Simon Petlura, Vladimir Venichenko, Hetman Pavlos Skoropatsky, they were all Ukrainian intelligentsia. And they had to live in exile, or they had to die, sometimes killed in exile, as Simon Petlura did. And Bulgakov, I think that he stayed with the same feeling that he took from the empire, that Ukrainian means peasants, it means something from the village. And that was because the intelligentsia was forced to leave, to live in the exile, or just executed or sent to camps during Bolshevik time. So let's say that the space of the empire and the Soviet Union was clear from any signs of Ukrainian intelligence. It went on with dissidents of the 1960s, and it went on with 1980s, like Vasil Stus, one of the most important Ukrainian dissident poet and representative of intelligentsia. So the story with them was always the same. Whether you stay here and shut up, or uh, you will be sent to the camp or executed or live in the exile, this is it. So even now, people born in the Soviet Union, they tend to render history of that period, you know, Ukrainian peasants fighting for independence and intelligentsia was of only Russian one. And that's the fake idea, you know, because of propaganda, of course. So because the historiographia of the Soviet period was ideologically restricted, the White Guard became a historical source, but it's a fiction book in the first place. And now that's what we're trying to explain. By this exhibition, we want people to have this idea of Ukrainian intelligence living abroad or just being executed. And Bulgakov with the White Guard gives this opportunity to talk about it and to elaborate, you know, to elaborate the period and elaborate how Bulgakov depicted it, his vision, his point of view. But it's not the only one. That's what we're trying to tell our visitors. It's not the only point of view. That's so interesting. But there must be some concerns that the longer the war goes on, the more Ukrainian society become sceptical of mm -hmm. figures like him. Do you fear for the future of museums like this and that nuanced interpretation mm -hmm. of this period? Or do you think that it is stable now, there is a strong foundation for it not to be mm -hmm. misinterpreted by the wider people, not mm -hmm. just the protesters you were talking about? Well, I think that we've gone through the most unstable period for our museum. I think that 
uh, it's quite the opposite, that people are now not that emotional about things like we were in the beginning of the invasion, and we are now ready to hear both sides, <laughs> let's, let's say. Yeah. And I think that we're doing a good job with this exhibition, explaining the past and also having this empathy for what's going on today, because it gives the feeling of war, but at the same time, it's give the feeling of kind of protection because of, it's like two worlds collide, the home and uh, the outside where there is war. But you can always hide. So I think that we are balanced. We open all the, s the sources we have. And it's very honest. So yes, we're somehow protecting the museum as the institution in such a situation of our opponents wanting us to be closed down. But on the other hand, we are working for humanity, let's say, mm. because we don't need aggression. We have the invasion, so we don't need the aggression inside of our society. And I think that the way we did that exhibition helps us balance this. So we are staying human. That's the main idea. I think you've articulated that very, very well. You referenced there how it is, of course, very relevant to these troubled times that Kiev is experiencing mm -hmm. as a city. Can you talk about how that is interwoven into the exhibit? I see there are references mm -hmm. to the war, there's uniform. Yeah. So uh, we've got some art objects of today's created under the influence of war, and they were used for different charity auctions for volunteers. And so the money for these art objects, the military art objects, they were used for our armed forces of Ukraine. But the objects themselves were donated to the museum by those who bought them. And these objects were made by women in art, and they are in the girls' room, in the Bulgakov sisters' room. We also have these, I didn't identify it for you, but maybe you've noticed it. We've got the Archangel Mikhail in the living room. For example, in the beginning of January, after we had one more massive attack, and Archangel Mikhail is the protector of Kyiv. So our friend of the museum, she creates toys and decorations and she made it just a couple of months ago. So we use the span bond clothes that we are using for weaving masking nets for our military. And it's like the wallpaper everywhere, the, the span bond, the green one or the, the white one. And of course, the jacket that you mentioned, the military jacket that belongs to our uh, friend who went to war in 2015. And that jacket was in Marinka with him. And he gave this object for us just to remind that now so many people are fighting for independence and there are women among them as well. That's why it's in the girls' room. So objects like these... Yes, they relate to the present period, to today's war, but they will support the general idea for our exhibition. And just to conclude then, you were in Kyiv when the full-scale invasion mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. What are your memories of that time? Yeah, you know, I was anticipating the war and it was somewhere in, in the air. And I remember the top songs on my list before the invasion began. They were Give Me Shelter by the Rolling Stones and Sag mir wo die Blumen sind, like Where Have All the Flowers Gone? It's an anti-war song from the 60s. And as well, Bob Dylan, Blowing in the Wind. Because I'm an English teacher, I know this content. So I was listening to these songs and I just couldn't believe that something like that would happen to us. Because I'm a child of 1980s and I was raised with the idea that there will be no war, never again. Uh, because of World War II, of course. So for me, it was a tragedy, but it was an anticipated one. 
And we just had to go to the shelter, which is near our house when the invasion began, and there were a raids, and we had to accommodate there for one night. It was the, I think, the night from the 25th of February 20 to 26th of February. I live in a district where there are lots of military objects, and rumor had it they are going to massively attack our district. That's why we went to the shelter. And that shelter is in the building of 1950s. You know, 1950s buildings, they often had shelters. And we were sitting there. I have a son and we are a family of three. And I couldn't imagine watching kids lying on the basement all dressed up because of winter time. And outside there was shooting. You know, backyards everywhere. You could hear it. Yeah, we could hear it, and the, the man standing near the entrance, our neighbors, they told us, don't go out, it was in the night time, don't go out because there is shooting. And then later, we knew that there were these people like undercover everywhere, because mm -hmm. they started renting the flats a long time before the invasion began, and there, then there was time for them to have their guns and sit in the windows mm. and shoot the military. These are Russian sympathizers in yeah. the city. Yeah. Agents, agents. firing on, yeah. right. Uh, agents. Right. And they would be shooting people like just in that military in district. The street. Yeah. I had not heard that, right. And we wanted to get back home in the morning mm. after the sleepless night. And we decided to go to Vinitsa region because our relatives, they live there. So I remember that, that feeling when you go out in the morning. And everything's so quiet, and you think that these people with guns, they might be everywhere, sitting near the windows, and they might shoot you. So you have to quickly get to your building, you know, mm -hmm. with your child. So we managed to get evacuated to Vinitsa and to spend the next half a year with our relatives. And then we just went back home because we wanted to, to be home. My main idea is to be home. That's why I'm grateful to everyone, to the United Kingdom and all the rest of the countries supporting us because this is the way I can stay here. I don't want to be a refugee. I don't want to, to have another life in another country. I just wanted to, to live here. And I want my child to go to the kindergarten and to school in Ukraine, in Kyiv. That's my idea. I'm just thankful and grateful for all the support that we have, including these rockets for air defense systems, yeah? Because that enables us to stay home. That's what I hope for. And my home is called Ukraine. <laughs> That's yeah. important. How do you feel at this moment? Do you think that this is going to be a long war? Are you prepared for that reality now? Mm -hmm. Or what are your hopes? What are your fears? Well, I think that we are reconciled with that idea that it might last for many, many years. My concern is that there might be no unity within those supporters and allies of Ukraine, whether to support it, to go on or to stop. And my fear is that totalitarian regime might be spread across the world. Knowing the history and researching the period of 1920s, 1930s, I know that for a totalitarian regime, human life has no importance. And I don't want it to come back to Ukraine or to any other country. So my fear is that democracy is just so vegetarian and human-like that it can't protect itself from totalitarianism. So the message would be to unite our power, our capacity to fight against that. This is it. We need weapons. Sorry, guys, but we need weapons to stop um, Russia from invading. And Because you know what they do when they occupy? They first look for people with identity, for proactive people, uh, patriots, Ukrainian patriots, and they were first to end up in mass graves. 
or in, in prisons where they torture people. That's what happened here because of Bolsheviks. And I just can't imagine that democracy is that weak to make it happen again. Well, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> thank you. To end the episode, an extract from The White Guard, describing Kyiv before the violence that would soon engulf it in 1918. Prescient in ways that not even Bolgarkov could have known in the context of today. Beautiful in the frost and mist-covered hills above the Dnieper, the life of the city hummed and steamed. A haze floated over the streets. The packed snow creaked underfoot. Houses towered to five, six and even seven storeys. All night long, the city shone, glittered and danced with light until morning, when the lights went out and the city cloaked itself once more in smoke and mist. But the brightest light of all was the white cross held by the gigantic statue of St Vladimir atop Vladimir Hill. In winter, the cross would glow through the dense black clouds, a frozen, unmoving landmark towering above the gently sloping expanse of the eastern bank, whence two vast bridges were flung across the river. One, the ponderous chain bridge that led to the right bank suburbs, the other high, slim and urgent as an arrow that carried the trains from where, far away, crouched another city, threatening and mysterious, Moscow. Love.